as we uh, get close to finishing up our uh, study this quarter on sin, it's, it's hard to believe we've only got two weeks left. Um, I'll be teaching tonight and then one more lesson next week, and then uh, we start another quarter. So we're wrapping things up. We're just about done here tonight. We're going to talk about the sin of being unforgiving. Um, so that's an interesting topic. It's a good topic. I don't think it's a topic that we spend a lot of time or thinking about. Um, and I know I stepped on my toes quite a bit preparing for this class and reading and studying and, and just going through all of the different things and the ways that we can be unforgiving. So I hope that I can relay to you this evening some of the things that I've learned. And I hope that um, in the same way, maybe some of our discussion will help you to reconsider and, and help you to think about your stance on certain things and uh, how we should really look at caring about and forgiving uh, another brother or another sister when they have done wrong. So before we get into our lesson tonight, let's go ahead and uh, go to our God in prayer. Our good and wonderful God, our Father above, our Lord, we come to you thanking you so much for this another day that we have to gather together as like-minded brothers and sisters to open up your word, to learn about all those things you would have us to learn. We thank you, God, for this building that you've given us. We thank you for all of the uh, eager teachers and students and children and adults that have gathered here together under this roof in your name. We ask, Lord, that as we open up your word and we study from it, that we may be able to take it and turn it towards ourselves and Allow us to examine our hearts and our minds. Help us to learn the things you would have us to learn to better eliminate uh, sin from our lives. Our Lord, we know that by nature, uh, we, we are not perfect and that we are sinful creatures. But we know, Lord, that we can continue to study and we can continue to work towards um, eliminating so many of these things in, your li in our lives. And God, we ask that you would be with all of those in attendance tonight, from the youngest in age to the oldest in age, that we may all be able to open up our hearts and our minds and allow your word to penetrate our heart. We ask that you would be with all the teachers, those that have prepared material. We pray, Lord, that you would um, allow us to have a remembrance of the things that we have studied and prepared. And we ask, Lord, that we may be able to do, do and teach all of these things in accordance with your will. Pray that you would be with us always, Lord. Watch over us and protect us. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So as I like to do, right, this has been a long quarter. And the, the whole root of our class, we talked about in week one, the nature of sin, right? Uh, again, this is just a, a refresher. This is something I've tried to approach every week is the nature of sin. We talked about sin being deceptive, enslaving, defiling, destructive, and progressive, Right? And I think in relation to being unforgiving, that there are certain characteristics when we think about the nature of sin that are stronger than others, right? We think about the idea of sin being uh, deceptive, enslaving, defiling. Um, you know, the whole idea of being unforgiven, unforgiving, is the idea that my brother or my sister has done something wrong, and they've come to me with a repentant heart, and they've asked for my forgiveness. And through many different levels of, of acceptance or unacceptance, which we'll discuss tonight, our basic answer is, no, I don't forgive you. All right, and I think all of us in attendance have a pretty good knowledge of a, a wonderful parable that Jesus taught, and that's in our material, um, about a man who owed a great debt so great of a debt that he would have never be able to pay for it in a hundred lifetimes. And the king calls up that debt. And he goes to the king and he says, I can't do anything about this. Right? I don't have that money. And the king forgives it. And then the man turns around and finds a servant or, or a peer, someone who owes a much less substantial debt. And he chokes him. And he says, where's my money? Give me my money. I need it now. And of course, word got back to the king. The king summons the man again and says, did I not show you mercy? Did I not forgive your debts? 
why not also would you forgive this man his debt? And it's a, a beautiful parallel, and, and the, um, the parable is, is, to me, very plain to see, right? It's one of those where it hits you right between the eyes, and it's the idea that we in our lives through our sin have accumulated so much debt that there's, there's literally nothing we can do about it. We are helpless, right, of our, of our own means and of our own accords to do anything about our sin. But God gave us away. And so we need to think about that and keep that in the front of our minds when we talk about being forgiving towards others and why it is that God feels that it is a sin to be unforgiving. So I kind of gave a, a brief preamble. Anything that I missed or anything that we could think about to define what it is to be unforgiving or why it would be sinful for us not to be forgiving or to be unforgiving. It's that simple, right? Class over. See you next week. Jake? I'd say this always comes from our selfish hearts. That's always what it is. If you're, if you're not forgiving somebody, because they hurt you somehow. Or they hurt something you care about, so therefore they indirectly still hurt you. Um, so, I mean, if we can even play the card and say, well, I was in righteous anger with you, and so even though you didn't do this to me, I'm I'm not going to forgive you or whatever you did. Well, if they didn't do it to you, then it's going to open your hands up and feel new. But anyway, um, yeah, you just got to, it's, it's coming usually from a, a selfish heart. It's just holding on. Sure, absolutely, right? And, and, you know, I think Jake brings up something that we can use as an example towards what we talked about last week, um, stereotyping or being prejudiced against somebody. You know, sometimes somebody does something wrong to us, right? I'll, I'll just throw out a silly example so that we don't step on anybody's toes or get too political, but let's say you go to a bakery and you pay for a dozen donuts and there's 10 donuts, right? I know, me and my food analogies. So you get home and you're happy and you open up your donuts and wait a minute, I'm two donuts short. And then from that point on, you think you're justified to have prejudice against all bakers everywhere. I know what you bakers are about, donut stealers. I don't like you, right? And so you think you have a right to be angry towards them, right? You think, well, they, they shorted me, right? And maybe in, in an example, they, they understand, you know, you, you, you go on Twitter and you, you write an, inst an angry tweet, you, you channel your inner Donald Trump and you talk about just how horrible things are, and you, you send a tweet to the donut baker, and they give you a free dozen donuts, and they say, sorry, our mistake, we had a hungry baker, here's some more donuts. And instead of saying, hey, that's great, thank you, right, you gave me more donuts. You continue to carry this unforgiving heart towards not only that donut maker, but all other donut makers, right? And so it's, it's something absolutely, you know, we, we might feel that we're justified in our unforgiveness. Any other thoughts on that? Yes? I think to go along with Jake, just that selfishness, not only when you're unforgiving, selfish, but I think also there's anger in there and, you know, just festering. And how many topics do we talk about in this auditorium that go through our heart? So you have to think that when you have that unforgiving heart and it's festering and you're angry, that it's not only affecting that relationship, but it's also affecting the tr other choices that you make through your heart. Absolutely, right? And, and, and that's the thing about it. There, there might be a, a point in time where that brother or sister that, that, that wronged you, um, that they've come to you for forgiveness and you know, you, you've kind of sort of forgiven them, but... Now they're on a meal list because they've come up on hard times. And now you might think, I'm not going to bring them a meal. Right? Why, why would I want to do that? I remember in seven years ago when they said something to me wrong and they accidentally stepped on my toes. Right? And so now it starts to breed this division. Right? And this is one of the things that we talk about. Sin is progressive. Sin is defiling. Right? It, it might not begin that way, but because you yourself have not truly forgiven that person, now you've allowed it to have negative effects 
on your uh, ability to, to be a good Christian. Eric? It also gives us a false sense of power and control. So we can control the situation, manipulate people to do what we want, right? which is inherently selfish. But it's, it's the idea of just having, having the power over the person, at least that's what we think it is. Um, but in essence, we've cut our own power. We, we, have, we have none. Sure. Um, we know what God feels, how God feels about that to the and it's funny, right? How many times do we read a book or watch a movie or, or consume some sort of entertainment where there's some devious villain and the way that the villain gets what they want is they find that leverage over somebody, right? I mean, we, we can probably all think of different examples of this villain using that leverage to say, well, you're going to have to do this. You owe me because I did this for you or I know this thing about you that I don't want. And so, you know, we start to leverage this control. And how easy is it, instead of forgiving our brother or our sister, to say, yeah, I'll forgive you if you do these things. Right? And I think the Bible speaks very, very strongly on not only that that's the wrong behavior, but that there's many things expected of us when we forgive. And that's some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. Susan? Well, I think in my life, um, there have been people that have sinned sinned against me so grievously that I have to ask God to help me to forgive that person. Yep. That's really hard. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's you know, a couple of these scriptures. The last one, Matthew 18, 21 through 35, um, that is the parable that I, I referenced earlier. Right? That is, in my Bible, it calls it the parable of the unforgiving servant. So before we get there, we'll just kind of go, go through a couple of things you know, Susan had mentioned. You know, Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Right? It didn't matter what our sins were, how great our sins were, how much debt we racked up, what our criminal history was, what our personal vices were. When we submit and we're baptized, and when Christ went to the cross, all of that was washed clean. Christ didn't say, I'm only going to give you 800 sins for your entire life, but 801 damns you forever. It's not what Christ said, right? But there, there is a, a particular path, a particular way for us to get right with God and a particular path and a particular way that when we fall away, to continue to, to get right with God. And so, you know, when we think about that and we think about the fact that we're supposed to be kind to one another, to, to what Eric said, right? The, the, none of this is using it or leveraging it or, or being ugly toward our brother, right? We're supposed to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you, right? Imagine if our God came to us and said, you know what? My son died for you. I literally had people spit on my son, drive nails through his hands, beat a crown of thorns into his head. Do you know what that cost me? And now, if you want that forgiveness, you're going to have to do this extra thing for me. That's not what God says. Right? God has given us a, a very clear and, and a relatively very simple way to gain forgiveness. We don't have to jump through hoops. We don't have to become a trick pony. We don't have to do all of these weird, uncomfortable things to gain God's forgiveness. And in the same way, we should not make our brother or our sister have to do those things to gain our forgiveness. The second one we see is Matthew 6, 14 through 15. Uh, it says, For if you forgive men their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespass, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. I read this, and again, to Eric's point, realize I'm not the one with the leverage right? The only being in this entire massive universe that has anything that I really want is God. At the end of the day, the, the leverage that matters the most to me is being with him forever and eternity. And the lever the, he, he uses that leverage for the debt of our sin to be very specific. He says, forgive men their trespasses, and your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive them, I will not forgive you. 
So that begs the question, and we're going to get into that in the material, what does forgiving someone actually look like? It's real easy, right? It brings a smile to my face when I think about it. When I say God's forgiven me, I know what it means, right? God has forgiven me of my sins. Those ugly things that I've done in my past, those things that, that you know, that, that I could keep myself up at night about and dwell on. I wake up in the morning and I know, to God, those things don't exist, right? It's like they never happened. They're, they've been blotted out. I'm as white as snow. <laughs> and that's an amazing feeling, right? So when God forgives me, that's what it's like. But when your brother does you wrong or your sister does you wrong, can your brother or sister wake up and feel that way towards you? I see a lot of creased foreheads. This is how I felt when I was going through this material, right? When you start to think about these things. Um, yeah, I think some of you know, you know, some of you know me personally, and there have been times in my life where things have uh, not gone the way that I wished, and there are people that I haven't spoke to in two, three, four, five, ten years, right? Because... Whatever the circumstance might be, uh, contact was broken off because uh, words were taken out of context, because things were, were left unsaid that should have been said, or things were said that shouldn't have been said, and you know, that person is no longer in my life. And you sit there and you think about that, and you realize, all right, well, what does God say about that? How do we make that right? Mark eleven twenty five 25 through 26 talks about that. It says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And I think about that, and that one to me is, is, has a lot of depth and a lot of layers to it. Because we're told to pray constantly without ceasing. Right? And then we're told whenever we stand praying, if I have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your father will forgive you, right? It's not like I can say, what's the, what's the human cliche, time heals all wounds, right? Brother, you really hurt me. Give it another two weeks and we'll talk about it. Now's not the time, right? It's not what God says. He says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. So, you know, if we think about that and we think about the fact that we're supposed to be praying without ceasing, we're supposed to be in a constant state of prayer, we can't let our anger, we can't hold our forgiveness for two weeks right? or, or, or some human determined amount of time so that time can heal those wounds. All right. Jake? Uh, this is how God, how serious God is about this stuff. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 says, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come back and present your offering. Like, even when we are you know, trying to give something to God, we, if he wants us to, to take care of stuff, because I'm sure he probably knows about how things can fester, and he, and he knows our human heart. Um, you know, how many times can we, do we have the opportunity to come and give our offerings to God? We have that opportunity every day. Not every day presents itself when we can make things right with our brother. Like, that if you know there's something wrong, whether it's like this person that he's talking about where he he or she thinks you've done you've done something wrong against them, or you know that uh, somebody else has done something wrong to you. You need to have you, you need to not be comfortable with that. You need to make it right. God absolutely. wants you to make it right now. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's yeah, that, that, that's the point that we want to have, right? Is the fact that we should not be walking around as brothers and sisters, not talking to this person or that person in this church, or among this local body, or or among the larger a body of Christ. Well, I don't want to talk to that person because I didn't like a comment they made at Bible class, or I don't want to talk to that person because of something that they did. If there's some sort of conflict there, 
God, I dare say, commands us to resolve that. Right? Because the longer it festers, the more division can occur. And that's not what we need among God's people. And then Matthew 18, 21 through 35, we're not going to read that just in the, in the, uh, out of respect for the time that we have together. But I, I think that we all know that parable. Uh, I brought it up at the beginning of class. Um, were there any thoughts or any comments specifically about that? So then the part that really steps on my feet, right? When a brother repents. So we read Luke 17, 3 through 4. I'll give you a minute to turn over there, Luke 17. Luke 17, 3 through 4. Um, Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times again saying, I repent, you must forgive him. A lot of times we have lessons on the seven times seven, right? Or the 70 times seven. And we think about that and we think about how many times it is that we must forgive them. But one of the things I want to think about is the beginning of this. It says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Right? So I think the fact that sin and conflict is going to happen among brothers of the church and sisters of the church, that's inevitable. Right? There's going to be a point in a time where I might say something that's out of line a couple weeks ago. Uh, Mark did a, a lesson on gossip. Right? It's one of those things where maybe I'm not even thinking about what I'm saying at the time that I'm saying it, but I've gossiped against my brother or my sister, and I've said something that was not mine to tell. I've said something that was said to me in confidence, and as Ruby brought up in that particular class, you know, I was really just trying to help my brother or sister out. I was trying to get them on prayed. You know, I, I was trying to get people to pray for them. I was trying to get people to care about them and to let them know that they're being thought about. And I said something that maybe was a private conversation between me and another brother. And in that instance, you know, I've, I've gossiped against that brother or sister. It's, it's not malicious. It's not the same as you know, Cain slaying Abel. It's that sort of thing where we have done something and we have offended our brother or our sister. And when that occurs, because it will, we're told that we should rebuke that brother or sister. And rebuke's kind of one of those fun little terms that we don't hear a lot outside of the Bible. You know, what do we think about when we think of the word rebuke? What does that mean? I mean, in, in very basic terms, right? Correct. It's, it's not one of those things where we take a stick and we beat someone over the head and we say repent, right? It's not one of those things where we grab them by the arm and, and we drag them up here at the, at the, at the, uh, the front on Sunday morning and, and say, you need to you know, ask the church for forgiveness. But it is one of those things where we correct them. You know, hey, Dwayne, that thing that you told your brother or sister X, Y, that was between you and I. You know, that, that, was a, that was a private conversation that we had, and I, I didn't want everyone to know about that. So, you know, we're going to have to work through that. And then the correct response for me as a brother or a sister is to say, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that that wasn't mine to tell. I didn't realize that that was told to me in in a manner or confidence that I shouldn't have repeated. Can you forgive me? And then the brother and sister's proper response is to say, yes, I forgive you and not bring it up again. Right? Not when we're having a, a function as brothers and sisters this Sunday and we go out for pizza. At Romeo's, we don't say, hey, you remember when you talked about me? Yeah, I want to get ahead of you in line so I can order my pizza first. Right? We're not going to hold it over their heads um, in such a way that we're going to continue to bring it up. Right? We're, we're going to forgive and we're going to let it go because at the end of the day, that's the example that God has given to us. Next thing we have is Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And again, this is part of... Uh, the 
parable that we were talking about earlier, Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to him, you've gained a brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of one, or excuse me, or two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So we have um, a, a very specific example of a brother refusing to repent, right? So there, there's, a, there's a specific way that we should let that happen. Again, with my example of, of me saying something about uh, a brother, the proper way is to come and talk to me. Try to work it out between you and I. And if my response is something along the lines of, I don't care what it is that you have to say. You told me. I'm just repeating it. Right? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it again. You, you tell me, and I'm going to do it again. And I, I show no repentance. I show a hardened heart. Then at that point, we can bring two or three other people, and we can continue to work with that person. And if they continue to not show repentance, then at that point, we're told to treat them, let them be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What do we think that means? Yes. By the context of who he's talking to, <laughs> right. it's how they feel about those people. Sure. Yeah. In the greater scheme of things, as we go down the road, the Gentiles obviously not to be treated that way. Yeah. Nor, Nor the tax collectors. Right. One, one of one of the people in his innermost circle was a tax collector. But but as far as the people he's talking to, it's an example of hey, let's compare it to somebody that you understand. Yeah. Someone that you would apply shame to, someone that you would not associate with, right? You remember, uh, we talked about this last week with prejudice, that Peter, after the Gentiles, the, the kingdom was opened up to the Gentiles, he would smile and laugh and dine with the Gentiles. And then when someone with Jerusalem, or someone from Jerusalem came, he would act completely differently toward the Gentiles, right? He, he would almost shun them. And so... We see that idea that the, the, the audience that Jesus is talking to, he's letting them know that this person should be basically treated like someone that you would not want to associate with or someone that you would not want to be seen in public with. It's not like you would go out to dinner with a tax collector and, and let people see you. Right? It would be one of those things where that would not be a relationship that would be encouraged. 2 Corinthians 6, sorry, 2 Corinthians 2, 6 through 11. This is one that I hadn't read in this context. And this is one that gave me pause and, and helped me to think quite a bit about preparing for this. 2 Corinthians 2, and we'll start in verse 5. Uh, it's, it's an, in my Bible, it's under the subtext, forgive the sinner. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, the punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. So, this is the, the point I was kind of hinting at when Eric had mentioned earlier the idea of someone coming to us about forgiveness and then us trying to use that to manipulate or control or to have some sort of power over that individual. We see in 2 Corinthians that it's exactly the opposite. Right? The first thing that we're supposed to do is to forgive and comfort him. If someone's truly repentant, and I know a lot of us have seen this in our lives, if not all of us, when somebody is truly broken by the gospel, when, when the gospel has penetrated their hearts and they are truly repentant and the weight of that comes upon them for the first time and they realize the gravity of the situation of where they are, there's a way that that person looks. Right? That many people 
I have seen just absolutely crumble. Just cry, remorseful. Um, what a comfort that person. Right? When we truly confront somebody about his or her sins, and they repent, there's going to be a time in their lives where they're going to need comfort, where they're going to come back to you time and again and say, I'm so sorry I did that. You know, I, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I acted that way. Can you forgive me? And it's our job to say, brother or sister, it's our good and wife's clean. Right? Let's rejoice in the fact that that's not something you need to worry about because I haven't thought about it in, in days or weeks or years. That's hard to do in practice. Right? It might be one of those things if someone has, has done something very strongly to you, as, as Susan has suggested earlier. Um, you know, and you're having to pray, God, give me the strength to forgive that person. It would be very difficult to sit there and say, you know, I, I forgive you. But when that person is, is truly remorseful, and when we are truly forgiving someone, then it's our job to comfort them when that remorse comes. Right. Um, one of the things that kept coming to mind for me, you know, I, the, the court is almost over, so you won't have very many uh, military analogies left, so I'll get them out of my system now. But again, I, I was already serving in the military when 9-11 occurred. Right? We just celebrated, remembered, I don't know if we want to say celebrated. We just remembered the 16th anniversary of, of the attacks of 9-11 here about a week and a half ago. And I was already overseas. I was deployed overseas. And it was 3 o'clock in the morning when the towers got hit. And you know, we were called in to our duty station and we said, we're at war. And... There was a whole group of people that it was now my mission to destroy. There was a whole group of people that had attacked the country that I love and that I swore to, to defend. And now it was going to be our job to make sure that those people cease to exist. And I think about that as a hypothetical situation. If Osama bin Laden had come to me and ask me for forgiveness for 9-11, would I be able to forgive? Right. Would that be something that I would be able to do? And I think all of us have some sort of wrong in our lives that has occurred where we sit there and we think there's no way that I could forgive that person. There's no way the the egregious sin that they have committed against me. There's no way I can forget that person. But if for some reason, you know, somebody that had perpetrated, planned, prepared, 9-11 came in and, and said, I'm sorry, can you forgive me? Right? And maybe not to me personally, but issued a statement to the United States and cried and turned themselves over for prosecution. You know, could we forgive that person? You know, could we be that type of person? And turning themselves over for prosecution for, for allowing us to prosecute them, I, I understand is a very different repentance, if you will, than the godly repentance we're talking about. Right? But it's that idea of what if whatever wrong it was that is the greatest wrong that you've experienced in your life, if that person came to you and said that they were sorry. And then they truly meant it, and they fell onto your shoulders and they cried. And they said, can you forgive me? Right. God expects us to comfort that person. Jake. Uh, the Luke 17 passage I've, been, I've heard brothers and sisters use uh, basically as a reason to not forgive somebody because they say, well, I don't actually have to forgive them until they repent. No. <laughs> and and I, I was surprised at I, I, how, how many people were... Um, we're kind of uh, uh, supporting that uh, that argument, and um, I had one brother who is who thinks you just need to forgive no matter what. Um, uh, said you know, yeah, he, he said that one brother said, well, you can't forgive them until you repent. He said, watch me. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> kind of two words that like, I don't care what you necessarily say about me not being able to forgive because they didn't repent yet. Like, 
I forgive this person. Right. It's done. And that's that I think that's that's how we should be. I'm pretty sure <coughs> my uh, set, um, uh, my assessment of the is that that's how we should be, not that well you only uh, you only forgive if right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Right. Right. And, and, and that's, you know, the, the point that I'm trying to make, and maybe I've belabored it a little bit too long, but the, the idea is that if someone comes to me, comes to me or you for repentance, the first thing we're supposed to do is not sit there and wag our finger at them and lecture them and tell them how wrong they are, it's to comfort them. Right? It's the idea that we need to tell them you're forgiven and to comfort them. And then after that, let me find my spot again here. You should turn to forgive and comprehend that you may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. None of this can happen without some sort of love. Seth, did you have something? I did, but he's kind of starting something to turn in my head. Do we have scriptures that talks about forgiving someone without their asking for it? Right, and, that, and that's where we're headed, right? Is, is when there's no repentance from a brother or sister. So let me, let me just... Sure, sure thing. thing. Yep. So, so the next step beyond what you were talking about, like Al Qaeda, remember, or something like that, like you might be able to conceive forgiving the act itself, but then the next thing I would like to talk about is the um, sincerity of the person asking for it. Sure. Because you might really question that person, like I don't really believe you. Right. But that probably that should be left to God. Yeah, and, 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 and that's, that's exactly, exactly where my head went when, when you started, started proposing that question, right? Is, is, is that our job at that point to see if that person's sincere or not? If someone comes to us and says they're sorry, and someone comes to them and say, leverage whatever civil penalty you want against me. I accept full responsibility. I repent. I'm sorry. I, 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 won't, I won't happen again. Right? Then it's not up to us as a Christian to judge. Now, He's going to go to you know some sort of civil court, and they're going to try that person, and they're going to decide, you know, what to, what the character of that person is, what the mental state of that person was. There, there's a whole legal side of it, and we have to be careful as as Christians not to get in to the legal side of that. But it's not for us to decide whether or not it's sincere, right? And and when I was preparing for this lesson, I actually um, was thinking about Craig's sermon that he gave a couple weeks ago. And that was the, the, exactly the point that Craig was making. One of the points was when you're told, when Jesus says, you know, should I forgive my brother seven times seven? No, I tell you it should be 70 times seven, right? Jesus was, was basically saying it doesn't matter how many times, it doesn't matter whether or not you think that it's sincere or not, you should forgive, right? And I believe that the example that Craig gave was the idea of someone saying something against you and then saying, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. And then a couple hours later, again saying, I did it again. I'm so, you know, I, th that same thing that I just talked about and I told you I was sorry for, I was with another group of brothers and sisters and I, I told them too, can you forgive me? And then a couple hours later, the same thing occurs a third time or a fourth time and you start to really think, is this person sincere, right? And the, the lesson that we get from Jesus from the, the 70 times seven um, is that it's not for us to, to judge sincerity, it's for us to forgive. And that's, that's why I want, you know, I want to talk about this. Even if there isn't true repentance, it's for us to, to forgive. Yes? Well, I beg to ask the question, how many times do we do to make the same mistake? <laughs> and God, yeah. probably, you know, God forgives us every time. Yeah. So without knowing for sure if it's a sin or not, that's not the point. We should be willing to do the same thing for them. Yeah. How many times have we prayed and said, God, can you forgive me? I'm trying to repent of this sin. And then it seems like the amen no, no sooner leaves your lips than that sin is in your mind again. Or that, that desire to do that action again is in your mind, right? I know my personal experience is that when I pray and I ask for forgiveness, that that's when Satan says, I know where the chink in your armor is, right? I know where it is that I can poke you and get you to dance, right? And so there, there's, it, there's a very real, it, it's an admittance that we have that weakness, and a very real opportunity then for that weakness to be exploited. Mark, and then Nathan. I guess it poses a whole big question in my mind. It's that what do we do with the model that Christ came and established? And that when we repent, that's when he accepts us back. If we sin and sin and sin and don't repent, he doesn't 
to worry about it. He doesn't focus about it. He doesn't prod us to do any different. Sure. But if we don't repent, we don't get the forgiveness. Right. So, and, and, I, and I agree with some of the information that he writes up in this material here. We shouldn't pin it up. We shouldn't hold grudges mm -hmm. against those people. We shouldn't act like we're upset with them. Yeah. But I, I have a real hard time forgiving if there is no, no sign of repentance whatsoever. And I kind of, and I look back to the model of Christ. Sure. And, and to use Christ as our model, one of the things that I think about is the idea that we're told that even though we were still enemies of God, Christ died for us. He didn't care. It's not up to us to judge. Them, right. But I forgive them. I think Nathan had something first and then Jake. Well, this goes along with what you were talking about, what Mark was saying is this is not easy. No. You look at Luke, and that's an understatement. Yeah. Luke 17. Where Jesus is speaking, the very next verse, the apostles say, increase our faith. Guess what? They had a hard time too. Yeah. You know, so these are people that are walking with Jesus. They they are recognizing that this is a hard thing. We need to recognize that too. You look at that passage in Second Corinthians chapter two. You know, Paul is talking about the brother who was sinning because he was in a immoral relationship in the first letter. Now Paul is writing back in the second letter about this same guy. And you know, verse 9, I wrote this to test you. And then verse 11, uh, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. Uh, we are not ignorant of his designs. If we do not have a heart of forgiveness, guess what? Satan wins. Yeah, absolutely. And bottom line is, we may have a good relationship with our, our Father and with Jesus. But if our relationship with each other suffers, we don't have that relationship with Jesus anymore. Is that our relationship with each other if that gets broken because of an unforgiving heart, Satan wins. Yeah, and that, that uh, you know, to, to circle back to one of the points we made in the very beginning of class, right? If we don't forgive, then we're not forgiven, right? And if we don't have forgiveness, then we don't reach heaven. You know, and so at the end of the day, that's not our place to decide whether or not that person is sincere. Right? Jake and then Eric. Um. I think it's also important to distinguish the difference between God forgiving sins and us forgiving people. Yeah. Um, God, you know, chooses whether to forgive or not based on what we do. Um, however, God's command for us is very clear about what we are to do with each other. We are not God. You know, we don't necessarily forgive like God because that's what the Jews were exclaiming about Christ. Is like, who are you to forgive sins? Who are you to forgive sins? We exactly. can't forgive sins. We yeah. don't. Yeah. We and don't and have that power. Right. That's not our realm. Yeah. However, we we do have specific commands of how to forgive, and that's that. That's what we should try our best to do. Right. And that's just hard. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. That, that that's that's getting toward one of the points that we may or may not get to because I just heard the bell. Um, but yeah, absolutely, right? It's the idea that it's not our... When we forgive someone, that's not equivalent to us forgiving their sins. That's us saying that I personally don't hold that against you anymore, right? That's us saying that whatever it is that you have done wrong, I will not consider those things when I'm thinking about you anymore, right? But that doesn't mean because Dwayne Campbell forgive you, forgave you that all of a sudden the kingdom of heaven is yours, right? It's not mine to forgive the sin, but it is mine to forgive the transgression against me, right? Eric, do you have a point? Yeah, Luke 17, we've referenced it several times. You know, Nathan mentioned the one side of it, uh, of, the, of the apostle saying, Lord, increase your faith. The other side of it is at the beginning of verse 3, pay attention to yourselves. It's, it's not a direction. Pay, pay attention to everybody else that's, that's talking to you and, at, and saying they're, they're asking for forgiveness and saying they've repented. Pay attention to yourselves yeah. and your attitude in this whole process. And his response to when someone says that, uh, that they were repent seven times in one day, his response isn't, well, question them to determine their level of, of forgiveness. Of sincerity. No, Talk absolutely. to them, look at them and inspect and see if, the, if they're showing the fruits of repentance. The response is, when they say, I repent, you must forgive them. It's pretty clear. And I think, you know, that that cuts off the argument that we can't know a man's heart, right? The only one that knows a man's heart is God at the end of the day. And because we don't have that ability, capability to know a man's heart, we can't know 
whether or not that repentance is sincere. So we're told to treat it as if it is sincere, to examine ourselves and make sure that we're not withholding forgiveness and by doing so, sending ourselves. Right? Um, 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23 says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And I think that's really the point that we're trying to get to, right? Is at the end of the day, if our brother spits on us, we're not to spit back. Regardless of whether or not they are repentant, to Jake's point, we should forgive. Because at the end of the day, all of those spitting, it's not going to be judged by me. That person is going to have to individually stand before our creator and give account for why it is that they did those things. And we're going to have to stand before our creator and give account for why we thought that we were in a position not to forgive. So if we, if we think about those things and we think about how we can resolve those problems that we have with brothers and sisters, and we realize and we open up our eyes to the fact that God views us not forgiving our brother and sister as a sin, I think that our relationship with one another will grow and that we'll grow closer to one another. Thank you so much again for some wonderful thoughts. Um, a couple of the folks that have commented I know had left to, to get children, but as always, I really appreciate the opportunity to teach this class. I appreciate, the oppor I appreciate the opportunity for all of you to comment, and hopefully we've grown and learned together. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you next week.